Hello and welcome to Salem Baptist Church. My name is Deep Mar Brady. I'm the pastor here. I'd like to welcome you to our Connect Group. And this morning, we're in the second part of talking about heaven. Okay, so this is um is an extension of what we did last time, right? All of these questions really are what will the heavenly existence be like? That's that is what we've been touching on. Um and within that, there is the question, will there be struggles in heaven? I believe that joy comes from overcoming the things that are difficult to achieve. And as another sub-question to what will heaven be like? I personally find the idea of streets of gold uninteresting and counter to the humble life of Jesus. So I didn't if, mean... I, I, I did not mean that irreverently. <laughs> no, I know you didn't. And that's an interesting and it's a, it's a good question. So we'll just ask anyone in the group then, will there be struggles in heaven? Will there be struggles in heaven? There shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. My mother, bless her heart. My mother was married twice. Her first husband got killed in the war. And then my dad died, and then mom took up with another man. And she says, what am I going to do when I go to heaven? How am I going to, she said, how am I going to take care of three <laughs> 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 Oh, you know, she, she just, uh, I said, mom, it'll be all right. <laughs> I, I just, yeah. go ahead. I just... I really honestly don't know because once again I've asked these questions maybe maybe it's I just listened to what I thought I heard for all these years and just went and go okay well fine mm -hmm. and and now I'm at a point where I'm going I would really like to find a scriptural base to, or at least an opinion that would say to me you know, because I think the only context I have is what I'm living right now. Right. And I don't know. And I'll say it another way. And I've said this before. If I'm talking to a non-believer for some NAA conversation, what do I have to offer for the, if I say to the person, you really should not, you really should limit what, you do in some cases here on earth because it doesn't represent, you know, things that are quote unquote good and that sort of thing. And they go, well, what's your grand plan? Mm -hmm. You know, why would you deny yourself? Because it just about everything says deny yourself of something. Yeah. And that in most cases as a human, anyway, so that was just a thought I had mm -hmm. and I just don't know. Mm. Very interesting. I ended up studying self-denial this week in um, a book called Desire and God. <clears throat> um, John Piper is the writer of that. And um, he, he is saying that basically the love that you... It took me about 45 minutes to try and explain myself to deep, uh, pitifully. But the love that God has for us outshines at some point. That's what we're pushing toward in this life. And in to be enveloped in that love, to feel that love, to share that love. And when we're in that position, the self-denial thing is, is natural. So what's natural to man is no longer natural to man. So you end up not having to white knuckle sobriety. You end up not having to, you end up having, you know, a deliverance that's beyond our understanding in all sorts of areas. So the natural man, the, you know, the, the unbeliever doesn't understand those things. Right. And I, I really did think about that for a while. Cause you know, by no means have we achieved any kind of position where you're in ultimate self denial of everything. You're only, you can deny yourself right. some things. We've achieved some things through Christ, but we're always presented with something new, some kind of new temptation. But I wonder, it, it really struck me what John Piper was saying, because he was kind of saying that 
hey, no, there's a place. That's the pursuit on this earth. And there is a place that you can reach that self-denial is no longer a thing. And I kind of meditate on that for a second. I thought about maybe some people on this earth that might have been in those shoes. You know, mm-hmm. some people flash before my eyes like Mother Teresa. What does it mean to kind of give of your whole life? I don't know Mother Teresa well, but um, Saint. <laughs> Bad. Bad. Did we watch a documentary? Just there's some people that completely gave their whole lives up, right? We forget. Oh, <clears throat> dates. <clears throat> well, we forgot dates. Okay, so let's, um, I think the, the question of heaven is really interesting. It's not taught enough. I don't know why that is, because there's a lot that's said on heaven. It's, a, it's an ending statement, really, to a question, isn't it? It's like, well, it'll be all right in heaven. And that's like the end. It's like, but I, I wonder why there isn't a little bit more done on heaven. Anyway, so let's have a look, first of all. And I think questions two and three... Uh, will there be struggles and the streets of gold go some way to to answer the first one? Uh, not completely, but anyway. So if we have a look at Revelation 21, in the timeline of the book of Revelation, Revelation 21 is the new heaven and the new earth. So that's really important to kind of fix that mile marker in our head and say, OK, this is the new heaven. And if there's a new heaven, uh oh, what does that say about the old heaven, <laughs> right, where God resides at the moment. So anyway, it says here, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eye and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. So these are just my kind of comments underneath there. At first glance, this seems to be the same old, right? The same old because, right, we have the Spirit of God dwelling with us. This is what we're told all the time, right? We have the Holy Spirit within us that guides us, that counsels us. I'm not saying that that's incorrect in any way. I'm, I'm just saying when you look at that passage, you might think, well, God is with us now. So what is the difference? Is there a difference? But I want you to notice um, that <clears throat> the Holy Spirit that was given to us at the birth of the church in Acts 2, that Jesus had promised once he goes away, he will send the comforter to us. That's the other part of the triune Godhead to live within us. Um, that presence is known within the context of this fallen world, right? So we still have all these struggles that we have with the the devil, the flesh, and and the world. But notice when God says um, that he will be with us, he then follows it up with that he will wipe away every tear and the former heaven, so all these things will be wiped away. This is a passage that we know, this is common, we've heard about it. There's going to be no more crying in heaven. But it's almost as though then that we are taking with us these remembrances of these struggles and pains, right? Yes. Because, okay, so God's saying this is a new heaven and a new earth, but now he stops to wipe personally in a very kind of intimate and beautiful way, right? He takes away personally our tears. So it's almost as though, hey, we're bringing that almost with us, right, into that experience. I think there's a reason that it that it's written like this. So, <clears throat> so under that kind of thought process, then whatever we're thinking now and whatever we're struggling with, as long as we believe when we get there is when it's going to be changed. Yeah, I think. Well, let's have a look okay. at this verse here. So Isaiah sixty-five seventeen, right? It seems to suggest that we have no recollection of this life at all, which will put it at odds with Revelation 21. Can we see that? Mm-hmm. Right. So it seems to say, for behold, I create new heavens. So we're talking about the same thing. Revelation 21 and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. Wow, isn't that interesting? So is there is there a conflict there 
between the passages. But then if you look at the one verse before it, so that he who blesses himself in the land shall bless himself by the God of truth, and he who takes an oath in the land shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten and are hidden from my eyes. And then it goes on to 17 to say that the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. So it's talking about troubles. It says, because the former troubles are forgotten and are hidden from my eyes. So when we look at 17 then, and it says the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind, it does not necessarily mean that they're erased, or that's what it seems to imply, but rather something is not going to be, um, you know, we're just not going to be recalling them. So it doesn't mean to say that they're completely gone, but for some reason, in our new sanctified mind, those experiences have been, I would, I would guess, or I would, um, my opinion would be, then that they have been cleansed. So do we do we have troubles? It seems to suggest that, but there's a cleansing process or a sanctification process, probably all to do with how the Lord wipes away our tears that seem to remove those things from our mind. That's is that it's pretty interesting isn't it so that means that we're probably not going to lose anything of this experience of earth but rather and again this is my opinion i think when we really start to experience heaven and we will then be able to discern which means to separate the experience in this world which is marred by sin everything that we do everything the whole system is built is predicated on sin why we do certain things because of sin the, the complications of sin the consequences of sin so <clears throat> i wonder does the lord not remove those things from us because in the end does that not magnify our glory of God when we, you, you hear the testimony of those people that got into the most trouble, that got closest to death, have the most remarkable um, transformation process. And I think, as Jesus said, those that have much to be forgiven um, have, have uh, what is the much to be forgiven, have much to be thankful for or something. It's something like the magnitude of right. your transgression is, is almost the capacity then for you to be able to glorify God wow. even more because of the depth of... Whereas, whereas someone that's maybe inherited their faith from their parents and then carried on and seemingly not have much of a transformation process, but gradually come mm -hmm. to know the Lord of their own volition and their own relationship, um, don't seem to be, and it's wrong to say they're not as passionate because I don't think that's right, but just the way that the Lord builds in certain capacities into certain people, certain characteristics, we're all different, right? Mm -hmm. We're all different. And we often find the most reckless and the most, you know, the most sinful of people, such as Saul of Tarsus, Paul, has the most transform transformatory um, experience and then able to love and be even more dedicated because of the capacity the Lord gives him. Yeah. And the Lord even says those that have been, uh, that there is a certain amount of faith that he will give each person. Maybe I should have included that verse too. So... I was thinking about... Um... <clears throat> Just to add to that, the um, turn your eyes upon Jesus, the, him yeah. look full at his wonderful face, and the and things, things of, of this, this world, world grow strangely, strangely dim. dim in the light of his glory and grace. And I think that just fits with what I'm saying. So it's not as though you don't you you don't remember. It's often interesting how you don't remember. You don't remember things when you're in love, right? You're suddenly yeah. in love, and you're like, I don't remember. 
I forgot about, you know, I left something on the stove. I, you know, <laughs> forgot to pick up my groceries. And I think it's that kind of yeah. forget, like things become Your focus and attention. As, is, is, yeah. yeah. And there's so much of that looking toward Jesus, looking at the hope to come, looking, mm-hmm. looking, fixing your eyes on mm-hmm. Jesus. And I think that that ultimate worship is probably just outshines mm-hmm. the whole experience. Yeah. I'm curious. Is that, that's a verse from a song, a hymn. <laughs> I wonder if that's scripturally based or just based. I on... just looked it up. It's from Psalm one. Uh, yeah. What did it say? It's from. It's in Psalms. It's. It's not. It doesn't fully allude to it, but um, because I was asked, I thought Psalm one twenty three one. Lift up our eyes, see the one who is enthroned in the heavens, to see him in all his glory. So turn your eyes upon Jesus. And then uh, Colossians 3, 2 is set your minds on things that are above, not mm-hmm. on things that are on the earth. And yeah, I mean, when we're not on this earth, I guess that's, that's yeah. kind of a uh, hmm. given, right? I think we can all, we definitely all have an experience of the more you focus on heavenly things, the more you really are able to turn off the world, like Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed with a renewing of your mind so that then you can discern what the will of God is, which is good, perfect, and, and acceptable. When we really do shut the world off, those things do do get less shiny, right? <laughs> it's when we are consumed and we are full of the world, those things have an attraction which is very hard for us to to overcome. And I think it's because you it has to be a spiritual thing. You cannot do it in your own strength, yeah. can you? You can't do it in... The natural man is unable to look past the, the glory and the allurement and the seduction of this world because that in itself is spiritual. It's demonically spiritual, but it's beyond the natural man. You know, he, there's something about the things of the world which just pull on him, that draw him constantly to go back to them. But it's only in our own experience that we, as we start to shut that off, do we really realize that there is something tarnished. There is something grubby about that stuff. It doesn't give you peace. Um, here in Revelation 6, so this is back now. This is in the present heaven. So this is the only other real point I want to make here. So that's future heaven. And we know there's going to be a renewed heaven. It says here, when he opened the fifth seal and I saw under the altar, he opened the fifth seal and I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. And they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long will you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So these are the martyred saints that are underneath the altar. John has been tra- been taken up to heaven. And we see that in Revelation 4.1. So he's taken there. He's viewing that. But he can see anguish, right? They're crying out. Now, they're either crying out because a sense of their own loss, because they were martyred, or are they crying out because they want to see justice done, right? And the Lord says to them, just be 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 patient until the full number of those that are going to be killed for my name join you. So we can see there that there is at least strife. There's some kind of anguish there. They cried out, right? <laughs> They're yeah. crying out under the altar. Do you think, <clears throat> I've thought about that before too, the martyred saints. I somehow think that that, I don't know how we could base that in scripture, but I somehow think that it's interesting that under the altar too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I somehow think that those en- that during the end times there's like a different transitional, translational situation into our final state of being mm-hmm. with the Lord forever. Right. You know? Well, there is because you'll notice here that this is the temporary heaven. God said he's going to remake the heavens and the earth. And you think, well, why does he have to do that? So so somewhere, I mean, I don't know. This is, this is way beyond anyone's comprehension, in my opinion. I can't, I can't really 
I can't reconcile the fact that God is holy and perfect. Nothing unclean can come into his presence. And yet anguish and and crying and those tr- those troubles are in of themselves not holy. <laughs> are they? I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But yeah, what an interesting idea. So they're under the altar. Maybe the altar is protecting them. In the, in the Holy of Holies inside the temple, God's presence was on the mercy seat, okay. right? Okay. So that's, there's something underneath that. The Ark of the Covenant had those things in it, but it was the mercy seat, which was the lid that contained or housed or God's presence rested on that. So that that is an amazing point. Yeah, I think that's definitely something. It kind of also fits with another big question of do we sleep until that day? You know, is there another justice system that's happening until that full fruition of Satan in the pit and mm. the end and the, the you yeah. know, God reign forever? But there's there, so many times <clears throat> it's mentioned, like, right now he sleeps. But, you know, mm. but then I know Jesus says, like, and tomorrow you'll be with me in paradise. Yeah, and... I know. Interesting. Well, there is definitely um, scripture to support the idea when when Jesus himself says, um, or Paul, I'm sorry, says that there are two resurrections. First, the resurrection of the righteous, mm. and they will be resurrected and go into the millennial reign with Christ here on this earth. On the, in the present state of this earth that will reign for a thousand years and then the unjust will be woken up at the end of that after the after Satan has called up to do what he's going to do because he's in the bottomless pit chained up he's going to deceive the nations once more so they are awoken for that time too and then the Lord comes and, and slays him with the breath of his mouth the sword of you know so and then and then it's done. But then at that point, heaven and earth is remade mm. according according to scripture. Mm. That's a good talk. Quote. So in the new new heaven, it's like now right all things. So are... this yeah this I I guess you could almost tie this to the feast of tabernacles in that now. This is it. He tabernacles with us. He his presence is permanently with us. Um, and Revelation twenty one would kind of suggest that that might be the case the eternal this that that's the ultimate fulfillment of the feast of tabernacles at that point and so just coming back then because we're running out of time unfortunately um uh, pers- uh, so personally the idea of the streets of gold are uninteresting um <clears throat> this is a great question because i've often looked at it and you hear people say well, I'll be happy with a pop tent in heaven, not a mansion. You know what I mean? <laughs> this idea that they I just think, kind yeah, of skate uh, into heaven. I think <clears throat> what I'm my, what I've thought about this is that when this when these things were written, you think about what they're saying here: gold, pearl, transparent glass. Transparent glass did not exist. Mm-hmm. But somehow, whoever wrote this, the, 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 and I don't mean that irreverently right. either. I'm just saying that the writer, I'll put it that way, somehow had to visualize transparent glass. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it says like, doesn't it say like? Like transparent, transparent glass. glass. Oh, yeah, look here, 2121. And 12 gates with 12 pearls. Each gate was a single pearl and the street of gold was pure gold like transparent glass. So it was so pure. Mm-hmm. It was so perfect. Um, and I just, I, I, I don't see that as being like a very kind of um, overtly, you know, an ostentatious thing. I don't think it's like the royal family with their gold embossed but carriage. I, I, but I, I, have, I have for the, my entire life... Mm had that vision planted yeah. in my head yeah. and I can't I find it super difficult to reconcile that it's, what, it's all I'm saying yeah. it's, all, it's all I'm saying well yeah. you'll just have to wait and see when you get <laughs> I, th- I think it's just, maybe that's true <laughs> I think it's just because that idea we can see it's a very human idea is it not red carpets you know 
gold cherubims and yeah it's amazing but it there is something i, I would very rather finite about i would that. rather think and this is my personal mind with all i have to reference this life is what i exist and what i know i would rather it's okay if the gates are that way but when i get in i would just like to see i would love to be able to see no conflict mm. yeah I don't think that there yeah. is conflict. I don't think there no. will be. Okay, he says, okay. no, eye has seen nor ear yeah. heard. So I don't think that we comprehend that. And We've listened to some near-death experiences, and one that sticks with me is a woman that went over a waterfall in a kayak, and she was oh, yeah. submerged for like 20 minutes or something. <laughs> she was dead. And she said that she can't, she's crying. She's like, I just can't describe it. I, the colors were colors I've never seen before. And the smell was like, and I, I feel that like I hear, yeah. hear through that. And I just, we I, have I to, we, that... we're going to have to post some of the heaven experience because they're so amazing. And I think when they, when they are biblically accurate, when we see scriptures kind of reinforcing mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. I think the Lord is, is gifting his church because we're all part of his church, right? Mm -hmm. Things that will try to make sense of what we see. So streets of gold, you know, the only thing I can think that, that, that John was trying to describe was something so beautiful, so incredibly wonderful in God's creative nature that, I mean, there are places here that you go on this earth and you're just like, oh my goodness, that is just like literally breathtaking. And you're like, you know, you want to share that experience with as many people as you can. And, I, and that is what I think the whole concept of the gates and the, and the streets, I don't think we're going to look at them and say, that's like a hundred carat gold or I think that's probably worth two million dollars right there for that one paving stone. I think it's just going to be more than more than we and we're in God's image. So we we are creators, too. Right. We are builders. We, we arrange things that, that God has made into beautiful things because there's something in us that wants to recreate or try to mimic that which God has done, right? Just mm -hmm. in his creation alone. So I think this really is just a picture of that. that it's just going to be so spectacular mm -hmm. that there's no real, there's like no words to God describe it. Promise to us mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a promise. It just, yeah, I think. I think this whole scripture bears that this is like a. <laughs> this you can dig like, into that a lot. Because <laughs> like I said, I. I in my mind, if I had to imagine what I would wish for, mm. okay, would be that I was I would I would be found acceptable mm -hmm. based on what I've done or what I've believed. And after I entered that realm, that I would be charged with doing things. Yes, <laughs> no, I, would, I, I'd be, I totally think that. Yeah. I would. I mean, totally we got. Enough. We got to get this ready to go. We got to get right. that ready to yes. go. It's got to last for a long time. Yes. I don't really know exactly what you're going to do to make that happen. Oh, but you will. You always do. <laughs> I, you know, that's what I meant. Yeah. That's what I meant by all of this. Yeah. That's what I meant. Yeah. Look and I didn't mean last... it. Like I said, I didn't mean it irreverently. Mm -hmm. But look at the last paragraph there. Because I do believe this is all tied up with our previous relationship with the Lord, that we knew him from before the foundation of the world. And it says there in Ephesians 1, uh, in, in Romans eight seventeen that we will be co-heirs with Christ. And we will be ruling and reigning with him, 2 Timothy 2, 12. What does it mean to rule and reign? That means there's a kingdom. That means that there are positions, right, subjects to the kingdom. You know, Don, I, I'm, I, I'm convinced that when he rebuilds the heaven and earth, we're going to be part of that. He, he's, going to be, he's going to be building galaxies. He's going to show us how galaxies work, how, how these heavy elements work, how, how molecules orbit with each other. He's going to tell us those, no, that's, that that's, heavenly knowledge. That's exciting. With, yeah. <laughs> Is that not exciting? Oh, no, no, that's... that's, that's... We're going to be building those like horsehead nebulae yeah. 
we're going to be doing so many things and we should look we should do some teaching on the heavenly thing because there's creatures in heaven there are what we would describe as alien beings in heaven there's different creatures but god there's something about mankind that he created us to bear his image or mm-hmm. not necessarily that we look do we look like him i don't know but there is something about us that he put us on a pedestal and that's what incited the devil to do what he did because he couldn't believe that there is something about mankind that he found incredibly um, distressing that the Lord would make this little creature like him, I dare say, in that. And he breathed his spirit into man. And don't forget that Lucifer and the angels were there at the creation so he has knowledge that the enemy has knowledge of heavenly things, heavenly, the way things work. And that's why he's able to come and do the things that he does here by telling human beings what to do. And I think all this stuff, all this GM stuff, all that stuff that we're tampering with, with the laws of nature is not coming from us. It's heavenly knowledge that the enemy has observed and he, he remembers what the Lord did. Because Job, Job says that he, the angels were there at the creation. They sang for joy at the creation of the Lord. So I think we're going to be busy, Don. We're not going to be sitting on a harp singing songs. We're not. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the message that I think needs to be communicated. I agree. Just in my opinion. I agree. Rather than this. I know. But that, again, is from the enemy. The enemy is constantly preaching. If you turn on the TV, if you watch programs, he cannot leave God's kingdom, the Lord, out of out of whatever he's doing. He always has to bring it up in a derogatory way, in a defamatory way. He's constantly twisting scripture. You know, the idea that we will be sitting on on a cloud. Where does that even come from? It's not come from the Bible. It's come from the enemy. This is the reason. Because he wants to make it sound so ridiculous and pointless. Mm-hmm. Like we, like people, I've, I've had guys say to me before, I'm going to be bored. And I said, listen, you're not going to be up there on a cloud. And they're like, well, I just want to be with my friends. And my friends are in hell, gambling and all the rest of it, then drinking liquor. That's, what I, that's where I want to be. And I say, it isn't going to be like that. Hell is not going to be like that. And heaven certainly is not going to be like that. We're going to be doing things in other dimensions. Don, we're going to be, we're going to be doing stuff that's just going to blow our mind. And we're going to be doing it as an act of worship. Like it says that, you know, that we will go. worship him for eternity. How can you, are we just going to be singing hymns over and over again? Of course not. How ridiculous. No. But that's a picture not. that's been painted in yeah. it, it, Maybe it was painted differently and I just didn't pay attention. I don't know, but I'm just telling you where I'm at. Yeah. yeah. Any other, any other comments? I just, I think on the par with what Don said, that that will be amazing. But if we think about earthly science, if you think like if you were a Jesuit astronomer, the knowledge that you would have from studying your entire life is a blessing from God. Mm. It is a it is one of the largest blessings on this earth. And if you could transfer that to heavenly knowledge, what is that? Like that will be, yeah. and then you that is of use. And we know through science that the celestial bodies we were just talking about this have a bearing on our souls. They have a bearing on our makeup. You know, we've separated these worlds, but at one time, all of that was one and the same. The study of the stars and the study of the heavens where the study of the psyche was. The She's talking about the, the zodiac. The Why is it that, that when we're born of a certain month, we do have those characteristics? Yeah. I'm not, it's been perverted. I'm not really talking about that. I don't um, want to plan no, the zodiac on it, though, because, no. but it is, a, it is scientific that if we were to remove all of those stigmas, there is a science behind that that's guarded by that stigma now, and that's tragic because that was a that was would have been Greek philosophy. It was ancient philosophy. It was, you know, now we don't study it. But if we had that heavenly knowledge, all of it in one, yeah. we will be. And that's our, I think that's part of our ruling and reigning. It's yeah. part of how and our capacity to know is just going to be amplified. Yeah, like exponentially yeah. right we we it says we're going to have the mind of christ we're going to be 
we're going to be orbiting with the triune Godhead. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, but it's so exciting to think that, you know, and, and as we grasp and taste a little bit of that, and we know the character of God is a father, is a loving father, is a protector, wants the best for us, then in the end, when we come across suffering in this life, we can kind of say, we can, we can do this. We can get through this. It's going to be okay because the reward is so much greater. And I think we should be focusing on those things. We should be using our sanctified imagination to, 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 to bring those things up and talk about them and, and let's embellish them. Why not? I don't think that's a wrong thing to do. God gave us an imagination. He wants us to use that. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength and mind. You know, he wants us to meditate on those things. And we can't just say God and like think of a church. I mean, how ridiculous. Do you know what I mean? That's absurd. No, we, we have to think of creation. And as we move forward, We know so much more about the larger seen universe. And we know now that there's realms that we can't see. Mm. So what in the world's going on Mm -hmm. with that? You know, that, you know, that's mine. We're starting to see. And they're they're flipping out. They're like, where is the God particle? We can see it. (laughs) We've waited. There it is. No, you can't see it. Oh, praise God. Thank you. Bless you. Bless you. I, I just... Thank you. <laughs> it's so Thank exciting. Thank you. Yeah, praise God. It's so exciting. It's so exciting. <laughs>